Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today's special guest is James O'Hara from Merrick Health. James, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks so much for having me on and making the time. Really excited to be here. Awesome. James, you want to let my listeners know a little bit about yourself and how you got so fascinated into, I guess, health optimization? Yeah, so uh, I'm a family nurse practitioner. And uh, to go back to how I got into medicine initially, uh, I started off on the patient side of things, interestingly. Uh, Growing up, I had broken a lot of bones, so I spent time in emergency rooms and doctor's offices. So that was really my first exposure to the medical field, and I just found it fascinating. And as I went through and had these procedures, and uh, one in particular, I developed uh, compartment syndrome which is a complication where you have a pressure buildup in a a muscle compartment, hence the name compartment syndrome. And uh, if it's not corrected soon, uh, you do have a a decrease in blood flow, which can lead to permanent muscle and nerve damage. So fortunately, my orthopedic surgeon was able to catch this early and uh, I didn't have any long-term consequences, spent the night in the hospital. And that experience was just really profound for me. And I thought that this is something that I want to do is be able to help people and fix people. And as far as health optimization, now that can mean different things to different people. Uh, sounds kind of cliche, but to me, I want to be my best at whatever it is I'm doing, whether that's in my career or at the gym exercising or just in my personal life and relationships. And that's what I get from a lot of people that I see as patients. You know, they just want to be their best and uh, perform optimally. Anyway, after I went into nursing school, I had some really good instructors there. And one thing that really stuck with me was the impact of the patient provider relationship. So I I recall it wasn't an intentional quote, but it kind of became a quote for me during one of the lectures an instructor had told me at the end of the day, it doesn't matter or patients don't care what you know, but they do want to know that you care. So I've kind of carried that with me. And uh, this is something I always keep in the back of my mind, really trying to connect with patients and you know, help them to achieve what's really important to them. In nursing school, I also really liked pharmacology. I just found it fascinating uh, and not just pharmacology, but also smart supplementation you know, because there are different people who prefer medications or supplementations and there's fantastic tools in both departments. So um, it was a really good experience. I was fortunate to have such wonderful instructors and uh, out of nursing school, I went into orthopedics, unsurprisingly. I started off in uh, working with a lot of joint replacements. Uh, there was a lot of joint replacements going on at the time and still are. And that was really interesting seeing the mindset shift of patients. So they would come in and they were used to their joint pain getting progressively worse each month, each day. And then they'd have a joint replacement if it's a knee, hip, shoulder, whatever it may have been. And then that mindset changed because there's still pain after the surgery. But instead of getting worse, now the pain is getting better each day. So that was really rewarding to see that, see people getting their lives back, being able to do the things that were important to them, whether that was to pick up their grandchildren or walk down and get the mail, whatever it may have been, however small or however large, it was something that really had an impact on me and uh, focusing on improving people's lives and optimizing health. It was really something that came out of that. Mm, Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. It's interesting how you sort of mentioned that aspect of the patient just wants to know their practitioner cares about them, not necessarily about their level of knowledge and that whole premise there is all around the, um, the therapeutic relationship between that practitioner and the client themselves. So I guess when it comes to sort of segueing into preventative medicine, to you, what, what does that look like? So preventive medicine is really about catching things before they happen, being proactive rather than reactive. And my first exposure to this was when I was still working in the hospital as an RN, so a registered nurse. I worked in orthopedics initially, uh, but shortly after that, I transitioned to a float pool position. So I would go to all the different units of the hospital with the exception of critical care. And I got exposed to a lot of different specialties and that was a valuable experience. I think it served me well, but cardiology and the cardiac unit was where I was at a lot. It was the largest unit in the hospital, and I got to witness things, people having heart attacks, people coming and having open heart surgery. And then the knowledge that these things were preventable was something that made me realize there were steps that I could take 
to prevent these things from happening myself and steps I could take to help other people prevent these things from happening. And that's really what spurred me to go on and continue my education and really focus on preventive medicine. So, you know, we talked about, you know, heart disease, primarily talking about vascular events, heart attacks and strokes and plaque buildup in the arteries. You know, that's primarily what we're talking about. And about 80% of that is preventable, according to the American Heart Association. So that's a big aspect of preventive medicine. There is some foundational behaviors, lifestyle factors that you need to have in place to live longer, not just a longer lifespan, but talking about a better health span. So not only living longer, but having a higher quality of life, things like getting regular exercise, things like eating a healthy diet, maintaining a healthy BMI, avoiding cigarette smoking, avoiding excessive alcohol. And in fact, those five behaviors right there, those are, you know, and a Harvard paper, I believe it was 2018, showed that if you just adhere to all of those, you will on average live about a decade longer for both men and women, which is a really profound extension in life. And everybody can do it. There's different routes to get there. So the foundation is the same, but the way that we approach those individual risk factors can be very different for different patients. Mm, yeah, you're really well said. The other aspect there is also something that pops up quite a lot is The relationship between group strength and longevity, have you sort of seen any research around indicating like, I guess, strength and muscle preservation in the context of longevity at all? Yeah, yeah, I'm very familiar with that research. And there is a very strong correlation between the amount of muscle mass you can carry into your old age and the grip strength, uh, how quickly you can get up from a fall, things that we think of being young and healthy as not major factors, but as you increase in age, the stronger you are, the more likely you are to be able to maintain that muscle, which is metabolically active tissue. That's going to be great for your metabolic health, preventing things like insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, as well as you know, being able to have good balance. So you think uh, a fall is nothing to you know, somebody in their 20s, 30s, maybe even 40s. But as you increase in age, a fall can be a serious event something we see a lot of you know, going back all the way to orthopedics and you, know, you want to be able to prevent those things. So working on balance, working on strength, making sure that you're getting your cardio in so that your you know, cardio respiratory fitness is in you know, top condition. Those are all things that are going to do a lot with regard to longevity. Mm, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I guess um, the key point there is having a bit of a balance between that sort of strength training plus some degree of aerobic conditioning. So I'd love to sort of hear your perspective from an exercise standpoint, if we're trying to optimize biomarkers and particular, you know, blood test scores, would you incorporate sort of both types of exercise or what would your approach be there? I want to interrupt today's show to bring you a brand new company called Better Brand whose goal is to help clear your to-do list and feel like you have the whole day ahead of you. Claim your exclusive offer with code BIOLOGY and get 25% off Better Focus, Better Brand's best-selling pharmacist-formulated vitamin for focus, energy, and mood. Better Focus helps you reach peak productivity and performance with a precisely dosed blend of natural, highly absorbable adaptogens and nootropics for a steady four-hour-plus boost without the dreaded crash. For a limited time, only at betterbrandhealth.com, get 25% off Better Focus with code BIOLOGY. That's 25% off at betterbrandhealth.com with the discount code BIOLOGY. Yeah, having both types of exercise, both resistance and aerobic training is absolutely important. Even in lean individuals, if they are sedentary, they can develop insulin resistance and you really have to move more. So whether that's through, you know, getting your 10,000 steps in per day, or, you know, just putting in your time on the treadmill. If some people want to approach it like a a chore and just knock it out or for people that enjoy sports, for example, like tennis, basketball, great cardiovascular exercise. And there's a social component there that can be very beneficial for people. And you also have to do the resistance training because you want to have more muscle mass on average. That's really your body's first line of defense against elevated blood sugars as taking up that glucose, storing it as glycogen in the muscle. 
And when that doesn't happen, if your muscles have insulin resistance, as much as 50% of that glucose can go to the liver. And once the liver is full, it's going to be converted to fatty acids laid down as body fat, which nobody likes. So you have to have a really good mix of the two for the best chance at uh, you know, maintaining your metabolic health and you know, being in optimal health and feeling your best. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Also, something you mentioned previously was, I guess, uh, metabolic syndrome. So do you want to maybe like define this term? I know it's brought up quite a lot. So do you maybe want to define this term and sort of what it may look like on a blood test? Yeah. So we see different aspects of metabolic syndrome, things like high blood pressure, disturbances in the lipid panel. So a high bad cholesterol like the LDL low good cholesterol, like the HDL being the good cholesterol, elevations in triglycerides, elevations in blood sugar. And even before that, you see elevations in insulin levels and fasting insulin is a kind of a early warning sign there because you may have a great A1C, which is about a, a three month average of where your blood sugars are at. That's tied to the red blood cells. So if they're circulating three to four months on average, you're measuring how much glucose they're picking up and you can get a pretty good estimate of where things are at there. But the insulin, you will see that rise before the glucose is up. So if somebody has an elevated fasting insulin, you know maybe their glucose is under great control, but the pancreas is working overtime to get it there. And that can be a problem because that puts more stress on the beta cells of the pancreas. And over time, that will lead to the miniaturization and the loss of those cells. So then you have less insulin producing capacity. So it really comes down to that hyperinsulinemia as the early warning sign. And then just, you know, working towards you know, being metabolically healthy, which means doing your exercise, trying to eat as healthy as possible and achieving a healthy BMI and, and using the biomarkers as a guide to gauge your treatment. Mm, yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned fasting insulin because that's something that's often neglected by a majority of healthcare practitioners. So I'd sort of love to dive into that and explore a little bit around number one, what do you think is the optimal range for an individual? And number two, how much does that evening meal influence that fasting insulin result? Yeah. So that's a, a great question. It can make it a little bit confusing because if somebody does have you know, a terrible meal or they you know, pound down 3000 calories and then get their insulin level the next day, of course, that's going to be elevated unless they you know, are exceptionally metabolically fit. And you have to kind of triangulate between well, what's the fasting glucose look like? What does the A1C look like? And sometimes those can even be a bit tricky because if someone has red blood cells that are smaller, like in an iron deficient state, those will circulate longer and you'll have a false elevation in the A1C. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if you have somebody who's donating blood frequently, you'll see a lower A1C. So a lot of times the best indicator of somebody's true blood sugar control can be just wearing a continuous glucose monitor for a time period. And that can give you a lot of insight into how insulin sensitive you are and how certain of foods affect you. And it also is a good behavioral tool because if people see the glucose rising after eating foods that they know are not good, then it can be a good tool for them to say, okay, maybe I need to not overdo it on the sweets or, or whatever their vice may be. Mm. Did you ever sort of get into the um, continuous glucose monitors at all, like personally? It's on my to-do list. I haven't yet, but I have done the, uh, the budget way or the poor man's way where you get a glucometer, do your kind of own oral glucose tolerance test, and then you know, see where the glucose goes, how quickly it comes down. And for myself, it came down pretty quickly, about you know, 45 minutes. I was you know, back down into what I consider a reasonable range, and it continued to go down, so I didn't have a prolonged elevation. But it is on my to-do list. Really looking forward to getting set up with one of those. Yeah, yeah. I recently got my second, second kit, and I've got it on my arm currently, and it's, um, the data there is like really fascinating. And to be honest, it's, uh, I feel like it's almost uh, destroying my mental health because I can't eat without feeling guilty. You know, anytime I see a spike, I'm just like, Oh, this makes me feel bad. But it's, um, the data, the data is definitely very fascinating. So I'd sort of love to segue James and get into, I guess, sort of the practitioner and the client relationship and sort of how you establish the balance between sort of being that authoritative person in the relationship versus being sort of collaborative 
Yeah. So if you think about it, the patient provider relationship is really a, a strange concept because a lot of people, if they're establishing care for the first time, you're going in and seeing a, a complete stranger. And the expectation is that you are totally transparent and reveal everything and everything that's bothering you, which can be a very daunting task for a lot of people. A lot of people don't have that comfort level. So just being open reminding the patient that you know it's a safe place that their health information is protected and you just with repetition you build that rapport and different patients have um, different wants as far as you know they want to be told hey you need to do this or some people want to hit here hey you need to do this and here's why and some people say well, what if we try this first? Or, you know, I don't like that plan. So there's many routes you can go down there. And it really depends on the individual's preferences. Some people really like to have an exact blueprint and they say, okay, I'll stick to this and this is what I'll do and it's going to get results. And then other people like to have flexibility. I say, okay, you need to you know, exercise, but choose the right exercise for you. Choose something you enjoy. Now, because if I tell somebody to, you know, go run two miles every day, if they have knee osteoarthritis, that's not going to be a good exercise for them. Maybe they need to you know, use a sauna or use aerobics or water aerobics, things like that, that are less weight bearing and easier on the joints. So there's many paths to get to the same route. And just because something works doesn't mean it's going to work for that patient. A really interesting study that I kind of use as an analogy for this is in mice and mice like to run on the wheels um, they find it stimulating and relieve stress. And you see all kinds of benefits from that exercise. But if you put a mouse on a wheel and it's running and it's a rate controlled, meaning the mice cannot control how fast they're running, that actually induces anxious behavior in them. So compared to the mouse that can run at lib or just as long or as fast as they want to, they actually perform less exercise and they have anxious like behavior. So that's kind of analogous to what works for, you know, one person. I can say, you know, if you run, you know, two miles every day, you're going to have better cardiovascular health. But if the person doesn't enjoy that and they're not going to do it, it's not going to work. So you have to have that shared decision-making process where you put together a plan with the patient because that's going to lead to you know, better compliance. The patient's going to be happier. You're going to be happier and they're going to achieve you know, their goals and then also the health goals you have a set for them. Yeah, I think you've um, summed that up really nicely. And I guess um, that's fascinating, that study. I've never heard that in terms of um, controlling the speed at which you know the, the mice can run on the wheel. That's really interesting stuff. So what about, I guess, in terms of just being in clinic and maybe in the last year or so, like what are some of like the biggest struggles you see with clients? So probably I would say there's two top things people are working towards. So I always start off the visit and find out what's most important to the patient. Ask them about, you know, your quality of life, your health goals, what's most important to you, and then, you know, what they're trying to accomplish. So the two of the big things I hear are, People want more energy and people want to lose weight. So you have to do a little bit of digging to figure out, you know, what the root cause of the problem is. And the blood work can be very helpful there, but sometimes it's a, a lifestyle factor. I'll ask somebody, well, you know, why are you, you're tired all the time. Do you know why that might be? They don't know. And you ask, okay, well, how are you sleeping? And how's your sleep quality? And they're like, oh, it's great. I sleep four hours a night. That's your answer. You know, not a, very few people, uh, some people, but very few people can function optimally on that amount of sleep. So you have to rework things in the lifestyle or, you know, maybe they're sleeping eight hours a night, but they have sleep apnea. So they're not getting truly deep sleep. And you can't tell just by looking at somebody if they have sleep apnea, it does tend to increase as weight increases, but there can be anatomical problems like a deviated septum or enlarged tonsils that narrow the airway, or they could even have central sleep apnea where they just don't have a respiratory drive to maintain adequate oxygen overnight. So a sleep study is always a good intervention when somebody has you know, chronic fatigue or, or any suspicious symptoms. So if excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, waking up with a headache or a dry mouth. Uh, in particular, if somebody says that they are, you know, falling asleep at their desk or falling asleep at a stop sign while they're driving, those are pretty, uh, pretty big red flags I see where I say, okay, I want to get a sleep study and, and see what's going on here. Mm. And for the weight loss, it does come down to, you know, calories in versus calories out. And we're, 
even medical professionals are notoriously terrible at keeping track of how many calories we're actually eating and how many calories we're burning. People tend to overestimate how many calories they burn and underestimate how many calories they eat. But there can be metabolic conditions that will slow down the metabolic rate, you know, obviously not to zero, but if somebody's in a hypothyroid state, it can make their energy levels worse. So they're unconsciously going to be less active because the metabolic rate is lower and the body's trying to conserve energy. And you know they will have a more challenging time losing weight. So identifying those things on blood work and you know, giving the patient some you know, a reason why, you know, you are in a difficult spot. It has been difficult for you to lose weight. So you know, we'll get the lifestyle foundation in place, get the hormones in place, and then it's going to expedite your results. You're going to get the results of the work that you've been putting in. So uh, really being able to instill hope in people and kind of change that mindset the same way that uh, a joint replacement, which I talked about earlier, gives a change of mindset where people have the expectation things are going to get better. Just reassuring them that it's something they can do you know, re reversing pre-diabetes can be done in, you know, six months, you can be with an optimal, as far as metabolic health, the weight loss and body composition certainly takes a bit longer, but as far as improving the metabolic foundation, that can happen rather quickly. Mm, awesome. Awesome. Since we're on the topic of, so thyroid, and you mentioned hypothyroidism, maybe do you want to mention like how common this is? And then also what we're sort of looking at when it comes to blood work, when we're assessing thyroid function. Yeah. So thyroid is very important. It's a hormone, so it has wide ranging effects across the body and it is very common. And uh, it's a bit ambiguous because there's a large reference range for both the active thyroid hormone levels and the TSH, which is primarily the screening tool used in traditional medicine. So you'll see a, a TSH that typically will have a reference range of 0 0.5 up to 5, and anywhere in that range is considered normal. But the patient may actually have clinically low levels of the active thyroid hormone, talking about T3, and the free T3 is really what we're after, how much of that hormone is available to the body is metabolically active. And there's some pretty clear correlations with the TSH and poor health outcomes, looking at post-myocardial infarction, if the TSH creeps up above 3.5, you see the long-term mortality go through the roof. And you see a correlation with elevated TSH and higher levels of bad cholesterol, because there's a very important relationship between thyroid hormone and LDL receptor expression in the liver. So if you correct the hypothyroidism a lot of times, then you see the cholesterol levels normalize. So you don't have to give a medication to correct the cholesterol. A lot of times you fix the underlying biology and then things fall into place. Mm. I guess when it comes to optimizing thyroid hormone output, you have sort of two sides. I guess you can you know, go straight to thyroid replacement therapy versus maybe correcting nutrient deficiencies. So how do you go about, you know, knowing when to tap into each area? Yeah. So there's a couple of options there. It's always preferable to be able to correct a nutritional deficiency and then have the problem corrected because there's a, a much lower risk of side effects. If you're just saying, okay, make sure you're getting enough iodine, make sure you're getting enough zinc, vitamin A, selenium, things that we are, are typically not measuring in our diets, um, either through diet or people getting those through supplementation. A lot of times you can see the TSH come down and you can see those hormone levels normalize a lot of times. So that's a good plan A, seeing what you can do naturally by optimizing diet, lifestyle, you know, doing all the things your body needs to have a stimulus to produce thyroid hormones. So if you're in a, a severe calorie deficit, eating like 1200 calories per day, your body's naturally going to lower your level of T3. Uh, and that's going to lower your metabolic rate just as a, a response, which was great when we had famines, but now it just kind of serves to sabotage people's dietary efforts. But yeah, I, I think a good plan A is to make sure you're getting the cofactors your body needs to produce and convert the thyroid hormone. And then if we're still not seeing the improvement in the lab markers or people are still having symptoms, then that's when you can move to a uh, uh, thyroid medication, thyroid hormone, and be a little bit more aggressive, but uh, still erring on the side of caution because we don't want to cause side effects. Uh, the way that I want to approach treatment is to get all the benefits of treatment without running into side effects. So starting very low and then slowly working our way up and careful monitoring is very important.
Yeah, of course, that um, minimum effective dose applies here big time. What about in terms of sort of, I know we looked a little bit on lab work, but maybe there's a marker that's often neglected as well, and that's reverse T3. Maybe you want to explain how this one can be sort of hidden, I guess. Yeah, so reverse T3 is uh, very uncommonly tested for, but I do like to see it on blood work because it gives you a little bit more of a picture with regards to the balance of T3 and reverse T3. So with the reverse T3, it binds to the same receptor as T3, but it's metabolically inactive. So that will prevent T3 from exerting its actions. So increasing metabolic rate, helping with temperature regulation, in particular people who have cold intolerance, you know, lots and lots of symptoms. I believe there are you know, dozens and dozens of symptoms associated with hypothyroidism and even in subclinical hypothyroidism, depression being one, which we see a lot of depression and, and thyroid tend to correlate very well. But the reverse T3, if you don't have that, then you don't know how good the T3, because the T3 level can look really good on paper. But if the reverse T3 is sky high, you can still have somebody with hypothyroid symptoms and a suboptimal thyroid state. Yeah. And I guess um, the other aspect there, and I'm glad you mentioned it, is um, body temperature itself, which is a, a pretty useful diagnostic or just general body marker to assess. So I'd love to, I'd love to just hear about your perspective there. Like, do you get your clients to measure their morning temperatures at all? Or I probably should more. I have on occasion when I'm trying to gauge uh, response to therapy or seeing if somebody has uh, a low morning body temperature consistently uh, that correlates with you know, some potential symptoms of hypothyroid. So I think it can be a valuable metric, probably something that I should you know, do some more reading on and start incorporating as a, another objective measure we can include in the you know, screening and also in treatment plans. Mm, yeah, awesome, awesome. I guess um, another side to this would be the nutrition side of things. I know previously you mentioned a decrease in caloric intake is going to lower T3 output. But maybe do you want to look at linking alterations in the diet with some of the androgens themselves, like testosterone and some of the other important hormones as well? Yeah. If somebody goes into a, a severe calorie deficit, then you can uh, really induce some, and aside from the thyroid hormone abnormalities, but also with the sex hormones, there's a, a well-known phenomenon in females, uh, athletes of menorrhea, where they're expending lots of calories, not consuming enough calories. So the body will divert resources away from sex hormones and reproductive functions. And there's probably a similar phenomenon in men. It's just less well-recognized because the system is less complex. So unless you're looking at the blood work, you're not going to see that. So making sure that you are not chronically under eating, that you're getting enough healthy fats in the diet, because the fats are going to be the substrate for cholesterol, which is going to be a substrate for sex hormone production. So you can very easily you know, crash that if you are you know, crash dieting, and that can have impacts on you know, a number of different processes. And usually what people come in with is their quality of life is impaired, they're fatigued, libidos have gone down. And, you know, we just do some digging and I always ask about, you know, the few months leading up to the blood work, what their typical diet was like. And if they're eating, you know, one meal a day, a you know, thousand calories a day, that's always a red flag. And a lot of times we can just say, okay, make sure you're you know, getting your protein in, getting your healthy fats in. And, you know, what you fill the rest of the macronutrients in with is less complicated. You know, ultimately, it does come down to calories in versus calories out and finding a system that works for the individual. So a lot of people are doing this because they're trying to lose weight. And you know, if you go to uh, like Twitter nutrition, it can be very complicating because there's so many different opinions out there about what's the ideal diet. And really, it's about what's going to be sustainable. So you frequently see the, the low fat group versus the low carb group. And uh, really, the outcome is, is the same. But the important thing is that the macronutrients are going to have a similar effect on a calorie per calorie basis, um, but a very different psychological effect. So some people will find that with carbohydrates, they simply cannot control their intake or with high fat foods, they simply cannot control their intake. So a lot of people will land on a low carbohydrate diet and they find that that works for them. Or some people will land on a lower fat diet and they find that that works for them. So it's really about what's finding what's sustainable for the individual um, that they can maintain and you know, 
uh, instead of having yo-yo dieting, regaining the weight, losing the weight, something that they can just maintain and uh, that they find sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. What about, I guess, um, overfeeding or overconsuming protein in that regard? Do you have any sort of um, research you can draw upon, I guess, how overeating the protein macronutrient, how that, how that affects uh, body composition at all? Uh, so in general, high protein is good up to a point. Uh, you can certainly get too many calories from protein as you can from any other macronutrient. But in general, if you are looking for you know building muscle or losing weight and preserving muscle while you're doing so, or preserving your strength as you age, then uh, overfeeding protein, not in the sense that you're in a gross calorie depth or a calorie surplus, but in a sense that it makes up a big portion of your diet is going to be largely beneficial. However, if you are you know, somebody who has maybe active cancer, then overfeeding protein and stimulating a lot of growth probably is not going to be the ideal diet for that person. Mm, awesome. Awesome. Something else I'd love to dive into, James, is um, I know we briefly mentioned the um, reverse T3 previously, but I'd love to know if there's any other sort of blood test marker that you think is absolutely paramount to be assessed at least once a year by, by everyone. Yeah, it's hard to say uh, at once a year. There's certainly a lot of good tests you should get a baseline on. Certainly a lot of things to monitor, and it really depends on the individual. If somebody is diabetic and they're, they're struggling to get their sugars down, then you know, monitoring those glycemic indices, you know, the A1C is going to be a pretty good marker there. If somebody has familial hypercholesterolemia, they're at a, a greatly increased risk for cardiovascular disease, then making sure that their apolipoprotein B is in check is going to be the best predictive marker for them. So there's a lot of baseline tests too, looking at things like genetic things that are not going to necessarily change, but that we can gauge the response to. So things like homocysteine levels on blood work or a lipoprotein little a, seeing where you know, uric acid levels are at. You know, if those are elevated, that can certainly cause problems. Aside from just gout, we know that that can be a driver for hypertension and kidney disease and a number of other problems. So there's lots and lots of good tests out there. Even some genetic tests that you are, are not necessarily getting from the blood. Uh, if you do a, a 23andMe or go through a self-decode or, or some of these other companies, you can you know, get a good gauge of you know, what some of your genetic polymorphisms are. Now, looking at the APOE genes and Alzheimer's risk, looking at how quickly or how slowly you may break down your neurotransmitters, how you metabolize caffeine. So you look at it and you say, oh, I'm a very slow metabolizer. That's why it always wrecks my sleep or I'm a very fast metabolizer. That's why I take it and 30 minutes later I crash. So you know, there's a lot of interesting things there, even polymorphisms that can affect your T4 to T3 conversion, where you are going to be more prone to have a low T3. Yeah, it's interesting because you mentioned um, homocysteine and that's another one you know, there's strong correlation between high homocysteine and a variety of disease states. So maybe do you want to explain that homocysteine marker? Because I don't think we've had anyone properly break that down on, on my podcast. Yeah. So with the homocysteine, that's been known to be a risk factor for heart disease, among other things. But heart disease is what people typically think of as the biggest implication there. And it's a defect in an enzyme that's abbreviated MTHFR. And when that happens, you can't properly, or at least you inefficiently convert that homocysteine back into methionine. So a lot of times you are not getting your folic acid processed into L-methylfolate properly. So you're not able to use that as a methyl donor to complete that conversion process. And also as a result of having lower levels of the L-methylfolate, you'll have a decrease in your neurotransmitter synthesis. So things like dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine all can suffer. So if somebody has a decreased sense of well-being, decreased focus, decreased energy, decreased motivation, a lot of times you know, giving your body more of the substrate for producing neurotransmitters. You now, L-methylfolate is one way to do that. And uh, it's a very common mutation. I think about 40 to 50% of people carry some form, uh, one of the two gene pairs. So some people will be heterozygous at the minor pair and they may not be affected. Some people may be heterozygous at the main gene pair and that reflects with elevated homocysteine levels, but you never know unless you get it tested. So uh, it's one of those biomarkers that you should at least get done once and then make sure that you're keeping it in range. Yeah. 
And when it comes to genetic testing there, James, I'd love to, I know you sort of brought it up there with MTHFR gene polymorphism. Are there any other specific maybe genetic markers you're interested in observing? Yeah, I think it's an exciting and up and coming field. Mm -hmm. So there's the uh, COMT gene, which determines how you break down your neurotransmitters. Some people more rapidly, some people less rapidly. It can be called the uh, the warrior versus the warrior gene. So you have people who break down their neurotransmitters very rapidly. And I believe there's an association with that having a higher prevalence of the rapid breakdown phenotype or genotype rather that leads to more of a, a warrior phenotype. So we see that in a lot of professional fighters because they crave that stimulation for the, the release of dopamine. And then you tend to see a slower breakdown in people who have more anxious type personalities because they have those increased levels of dopamine, increased levels of norepinephrine, which can sometimes lead to the development of anxiety. But there's probably you know, right now, maybe a dozen or better SNPs you could look at that are uh, pretty important for you know just looking and, and stratifying and knowing a little bit more about yourself. But then there's can be some things like uh, the BRCA mutations for things like breast cancer, where your lifetime incidence of breast cancer for females can be very high, as high as you know ninety percent, and uh, also ovarian cancer, which is a little bit more complicating. But those genes have a very strong predictive power. So I think that will start to become more mainstream looking at things like that saying, okay, you know, we know this is likely to happen. So what can we do to prevent it? Mm, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I guess another thing there as well would be um, which sort of area of medicine are you excited to see more research in that sort of lacking? Probably in the area of uh, cancer treatment and cancer prevention. So we've talked a lot about heart disease because it's the number one killer, but cancer is number two and it's much less preventable. About 40 to 50% of cancer cases may be preventable depending on you know, which organization you're looking at. So uh, it's a great contrast from the 80% of heart disease. So heart disease is fairly simple, but cancer research is still an emerging field there's promising new treatments coming out all the time, really ongoing research, including repurposing old drugs, which is something that I've been keeping uh, pretty close tabs on with things like metformin, rapamycin, and the rapalogs. And with the you know, metformin, it's been long known that there's an association there with uh, a longer lifespan. It came out of a large study in the UK where the diabetic population was actually outliving the non diabetic control group. So with metformin, it appears that anybody who's not in optimal metabolic health stands to benefit from a longevity perspective there, at least in the short term, getting into metabolic health. And uh, metformin tends to actually decrease mTOR signaling, which is frequently disrupted in certain cancers, a lot of cancers actually. So there's a really good experiment that showed this in action, in vivo experiment, where they had patients waiting to have their prostate taken out for prostate cancer. And since the patients you know, had the prostate cancer, we knew it was there. They started these patients on metformin, and then they looked at the differences in the cells under the microscope after the prostates were removed. And what they found was a decrease in a certain staining of 4-EBP1, which is a downstream marker of mTOR signaling. So that's objective evidence that you were decreasing the mTOR signaling and potentially attenuating that overactivation that you see in cancers, particularly in prostate cancer, when they become resistant to androgen deprivation therapy. And as we know, prostate cancers are driven by androgens. So dutasteride, which lowers the testosterone conversion to DHT very significantly, will slow the progression of prostate cancer. And we've seen this where people are given dutasteride for several years and compared to the control groups, they have less progression of the cancer cells. And there's actually a study that has not yet started. They're looking at doing the same thing with metformin. It's called the MASS trial, the metformin active surveillance trial, where they're going to look at patients with prostate cancer that are going to be on active surveillance, and they're going to give them metformin and see if we see the same results where there's a, a decrease in the progression and growth of those tumors. So I think uh, metformin is very promising. Certainly not for a curative treatment, but for adjunct treatment, since it's safe, been around for a long time and well tolerated. And then um, for maybe a chemo prevention standpoint from somebody who has a, a very high risk, a very strong history. So 
Metformin is one, and then you know, rapamycin, which has been around for a long time, appears to be well tolerated in certain dosage schemes. So there are a number of rapalogs as well, like uh, Everolimus, which has some interesting data, not just in animal models now, but in human studies where Everolimus was given in a once weekly fashion, found to improve immune response in elderly adults in response to, uh, I believe it was influenza vaccination. So um, you, know, you think of it as immunosuppressant, but it appears when it's given on an intermittent schedule that it has some different effects. Everolimus, there's also people who are hyper responders to that when it's used in chemotherapy. There was a, a case study I was looking at where a man had uh, metastatic renal cancer. So metastatic kidney cancer and the typical five-year survival odds there is about 12 or 13 percent. But he was maintained on Everolimus monotherapy, meaning just taking the Everolimus for a period of seven years. And it wasn't curative, of course, but it did shut down that you know, mTOR pathway. And unfortunately, I don't know what the dosing scheme was there, the dosing schedule, but the fact that he was able to survive for you know, over seven years on the Everolimus, when you look at the odds of the five-year survival, it can be a very potent treatment for certain people. And that's where you get into some things that are more advanced than uh, I have knowledge of in oncology and you get into precision medicine and looking at what tumors and what cancer cells are going to respond to certain treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just for general you know, anti-aging, there's a number of PhD researchers and prominent physicians in the kind of scientist influencer community that have started using rapamycin with the idea of preventing aging or preventing some of the age-related damage. And we have proof of concept studies there and animal models in particular, as we talked about earlier, the importance of strength and muscle function as we age. And we do see with uh, rapamycin given in mouse models, or rat model, I forget which it is, but there's an attenuation of that reduced muscle function or impaired muscle function that increases in age. So those are all things that I think are very promising and exciting. You know, certainly sometimes the marketing does get ahead of the research, but I think it's interesting to watch and look forward to seeing those papers continue to be published. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I'm really glad you brought up both of those um, medications because um the whole aspect of um, repurposing drugs also really fascinates me and even with some supplements as well. I'm glad you brought up specifically metformin. It's a, I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with metformin. You know, it's uh, awesome for like that metabolic syndrome, the insulin sensitivity, but then can drive up that SHBG slightly and um, lower B12. But I tap into it every now and then if I'm having a, having a bit of a cheat meal here and there. Not, not medical advice for those listening in. But yeah, I think that's really cool. What about in terms of fairly new at the moment, the um, ozempic or semi semaglutide, those GLP-1 agonists, have you done any sort of research in that area at all? Yeah, they're very promising therapies and they're very effective as we saw the new approval come out specifically for weight loss over the summer. And then the extended data on those studies, it's not just an initial drop off in weight loss where people are gaining it back, but it's sustained while they're on the medication. So uh, it's much preferable, in my opinion, just from a, a mechanistic standpoint compared to some of the stimulant medications for weight loss, which come with their own side effects, increasing heart rate, anxiety, blood pressure, insomnia, and then people having a crash when they come off because the you know dopamine receptors have downregulated and it takes a while to get back to baseline and then they've gained the weight back. With the semaglutide, it improves pancreatic function. So you're going to have lower blood sugars faster after meals because you're going to have more postprandial insulin secretion appropriately. And what you what patients feel from a, a physical perspective is it makes it easier for them to adhere to a diet plan. Now they're going to get full faster and stay full longer. A common side effect there is nausea, but that tends to be dose dependent. So in the studies, they do use a dose escalation where they're bumping up the dose every four weeks, all the way up to you know, 2.4 milligrams for you know, semaglutide, for example, once weekly. But you don't necessarily have to do the dose escalation. A lot of people will get by with, as we spoke about earlier, the minimum effective dose. So certainly if people are nauseous and throwing up and getting dehydrated, as we saw in some of the clinical studies, they will lose weight, but that's not improving their quality of life, at least not in the short term. So a lot of times using the minimum effective dose there so that people can lose weight, sort of use it as training wheels, because if you maintain the same dietary habits that you had while you were 
on the medication uh, and you get rid of the medication, you keep the insulin sensitivity, you maintain the same habits, you can continue to lose weight, you can maintain the weight that you did lose. And really the medication, a lot of times is just like training wheels, but it is interesting to see, you know, how you'll have people where they're eating, you know, 1500 calories per day. You know, they report they're keeping track of everything and they can't lose weight. And then you start them on the semaglutide. And then one of two things happen, either their math skills become much better or they are actually in a calorie deficit. So it's really interesting. And, and the patient's happy, you know, the providers are happy. It's a really promising medication. Yeah, really well said. Something that popped up there, James, I guess, do you want to provide some clarity around the fact that some of these medications can help with glucose-dependent insulin release, this sort of um, aspect there, I guess people are scared of having high fasting insulin, and I understand that, but maybe do you want to clarify how some of these medications can actually help to they have like an insulinogenic effect so maybe do you want to clarify what that means and why that's actually beneficial? Yeah, absolutely. So with the semaglutide or the GLP-1 class in general, you will release an appropriate amount of insulin you know, following a meal, which brings your blood sugar level down to uh, an optimal range quicker. So you avoid the oxidative stress and damage that occurs as a result of the prolonged high blood sugars after meals. So there's another class of medications that does a similar thing, but I'm talking about the sulfonylurea classes, so drugs like glipizide and glimpride, but those are actually associated with weight gain and also associated with increase in vascular events because they promote a much higher release of insulin and they don't do anything to suppress the appetite. So in general, people are going to put on weight and not get better on those medications. Whereas with the semaglutide, it does have that appetite suppressive effect. And for people that are worried about, well, if I don't eat enough, I'm going to you know, lose my muscle while I'm dieting. When you have that postprandial insulin spike, that's going to really help to partition nutrients, make sure that you're getting that glycogen uptake into the muscle. So you're you know, preserving the muscle. It would be what I would consider one of the more anabolic weight loss medications. If you can say that, I guess that's a bit of an oxymoron. Yeah, that's awesome. It's awesome. And, and in terms of... Um administration currently the dosage frequency it's usually right once a week injection is that right yeah depending on the medication your know, semaglutide is the most popular one which is a, a once per week administration and it's really you know, it's something that is doable for a lot of people because everybody can take five minutes and you know do their injection once per week sometimes people have a harder time with adherence with daily injections so some of the medications that are the same, same class GLP ones, they just don't have the same duration of action or you know, daily administration. But I think that what we'll see you know, when they have you know, long-term comparative data is that people are going to be much more adherent to the once weekly injection, just for the you know, sake of a minimal time investment with a, a maximal reward. Mm, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, James, did you want to let my listeners know where they can either work with you directly or or connect with you if they're interested in, you know, improving their health. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I have a website, jamesoharanp.com with a blog that I post fairly regularly, just putting health education, health information out there that people may not be aware of. I'm on Instagram at jamesoharanp. And then if people want to work with me directly, they can go to americhealth.com and order blood work and schedule an intake. Awesome. I'll be sure to leave those linked in the show notes for those listening in. But uh, James, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks so much, Lucas. Great talk. Had a blast. Awesome.